All right. Hey, uh, I'm Mike McGordy from Mike'sBackyardNursery.com. Uh, Dustin and I are doing this webinar to try and uh, help people uh, figure out exactly what our backyard growing system is about, what our members area is about, and what this business of growing and selling small plants at home is about. And um, trying to, to simplify it for you to, to show you how easy it is to really get started at whatever level you want to be at. Um, Dustin, you have, you want to introduce yourself? And Yeah, so I'm Dustin McCrory, Mike's son. Um, we live opposite ends of the country, but uh, yeah, so we're just running this, this free webinar tonight, mostly uh, so that we can answer questions. So part of what we're going to do here, if you're not familiar with how Zoom works, is you can use it on any device where the, uh, the, the questions are at on your device could be hit or miss. I don't, they move it around depending on which way you got your device turned. So look for the Q&A section and you can submit any question at any time throughout tonight's webinar. Um, and we will try as hard as we can to answer all of them uh, without, you know, staying on here through uh, midnight tonight so and any question that you have uh, we are more than happy to answer it because this is you know we do this in our members area every day too and and you know i don't ever want people to feel intimidated or that their question is too simple or, or just too naive to ask because if you're wondering there's other people that are wondering too uh, and that, that's why we're doing that doing this so um Dustin is going to kind of keep an eye on questions and, uh, you know, uh, let, make me aware and uh, I will address them as we go. So one, one of the things that, uh, that I want to kind of touch on is, is the simplicity of how simple this can be. Dustin, did you ever send off that recent video I did with me and the donkeys and the two flats of dappled willow that I just did recently? I think I did. I don't remember if what newsletter it was in, but I'm pretty sure that it was linked in there somewhere. All right, because I didn't. I don't remember answer, answering or seeing many comments on that. So, but anyway, yeah. if you're if you're curious about that, I did a, a short video, and it was about. I was really trying to show you how much you can do in a very small space. Actually, what I was using as a reference point it was an area the size of your dining room table, and that is like probably the second post at mikesbackyardnursery.com right now. And the, the, probably the first post is something that I just put up a couple of days ago. This is something that I've been sharing for years and years and years. And finally, I, I decided to make it a post on Mike's Backyard Nursery. Uh, years ago, I did a little, it, was, it started out as just like an email thing. And it was 25 plants that are uh, easy to propag prop propagate and sell like crazy or easy to grow and sell like crazy. So when I did the original list, I think I ended up with 37 plants on the list and then other members, you know, added things that, that sell really well for them. And then people that are in Southern states, because I'm, I'm in Ohio, it's a Northern state. So what I grow and sell is a little bit different than what somebody in like zone eight, nine or 10 might do. Um, so that, that got to be a very, very long, but very gr good list of things that grow and sell like crazy for not only for me, but for our members all over the country, no matter what zone you're in. So we can check uh, that out. We That's can show that now if you want to real quick. If you want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe not, maybe not so quick. We'll see here. <laughs> But, but anyway, that's a, that's a great resource and it kind of gives you, because that's, that's one of the first questions that people ask me when they, when they do get involved in memory theory, what should I grow? Well, number one, you should grow. All right, so there's the, this is Mike's Beckard Nursery. So these are the two right here. That right. You're talking about. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I sent this one out yet. I didn't get a chance to put that one in one yet. Okay. And then the third one down, Tips and Tricks for Growing Plants from Seed, that's actually an article that was written by one of our members, and it's very detailed about, about growing plants from seed, and it's, it's just a sea of really, really good information about that, and, you know, uh, so anyway, make sure you check that out. You can probably print that off if you want to. Um, this is the 21 plants that are easy to grow and sell like crazy, so... Uh, I mean, and that's that was my basic list, but then uh, our members helped with the rest of these below that first group. So, you know, and 
th th that's the beauty of this is all of these things sell and and they are relatively easy to easy to to propagate easy to grow um and of course you know you can also buy stuff wholesale you can buy stuff in our members area to sell and resell i propagate a ton of stuff but i also buy a lot of perennials and stuff that i just i'm not much of a, of a guy that grows things from seed i, I just don't have the a lot of our members are like mike dissinger who did that that article you know he loves to grow things from seed me not so much so a lot of that kind of stuff i will buy from members i've been buying from our members for i don't know probably i've been online teaching this stuff for i think what 22 years now or 23 years maybe yeah. 1999 um, yeah 1999 so and, and the number of people that have done this and done it successfully has been absolutely amazing so one of the things that I constantly remind our members and I want to remind everybody is that there are a lot of patented plants and there's another article, a few articles down on Mike's Becker and I did not too long ago on patented plants and trademark plants and things like, you know, so that's very informative. So you understand the difference. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about that right now. Um, <clears throat> but so there are a lot of plants out there that are absolutely beautiful and they're getting kicked to the curb because there are new plants that have sexy names that carry a patent that means somebody is, is earning a royalty by promoting those plants and selling those plants so when you go into a garden center and you see all these plants that are in branded containers they're colored containers that have that some kind of a brand name on them those are probably patented plants at the very least are plants that are carrying a registered trademark. I might buy a patented plant from like one of my perennial uh, wholesale growers. I'll buy them. I have a problem because typically when I buy a perennial, um, I can, I can, it's patented. I can buy it and I can pot it up and resell it. I just can't propagate it. But if I, let's say I buy it for like a, a dollar 18 and I pay about a 25 cent royalty on it within a matter of weeks, I can sell it for $7.97. So it's still a very, very profitable thing to do. And it, like just now I came from uh, the buy sell board in the members area. I was over there lurking around and there's uh, one of our members in there right now that has perennials in there for 25 cents a piece. You know, some of the things are 50 cents a piece. So it doesn't, it's not hard to get started. But anyway, my point is some of these things like a silver dollar hydrangea is a perfect example. It's a beautiful hydrangea. If you go looking for it locally, you probably won't find it because it's not patented. Nobody's earning a royalty on it. So it's kind of getting kicked to the curb. So what I'm doing, and I, and I encourage our members to do, is start growing that thing and then make sure it never gets pushed off the, the edge of the earth. I mean, these plants are way too beautiful for that to happen. And, you know, um, I, I talk about a lot of them like that, you know. And another one that I, I sell a ton of and everybody wants is Snow Angel Coral Bells really really difficult for you to find because it's not patented it doesn't have a sexy name but it is probably one of my favorite uh, coral bells and people are looking for them all the time for that reason not many whole mainstream wholesalers uh, sell it so my my goal here is to make sure that I always have some on hand and you know at least uh, members in our local area can come and grab some from me and, and start growing them that way but a lot of times, no matter what you're looking for, you can find it within our members area that somebody might be able to get hook you up with with anywhere from two to three to five to, to 50 or 500. So anyway, I see we have two questions in there. So um, let's kind of dive into that. Yeah, so the first one is, Mike, thank you for this session. I'm in Ohio near Cincy. Um, I have an LLC. Do I also need a license to grow too? And if so, do I need it before I even start? Yeah, great questions. Um, you know, your, your LLC is a kind of a personal thing that's to protect you as an entrepreneur. Everybody that sells plants has to be licensed in, and in pretty much every state that I'm aware of. Like in Ohio, you in order to grow and sell plants, you have to have a nursery stock grower's license or a producer's license. And the reason for that is, it, is it, when you apply for a grower's license or, or a, a producer's license, the state inspectors come out and they are going one at least once a year, they're going to come out. They want to look around at your nursery. All they're really interested in is your plants. They want to make sure that your plants are not infested with some kind of 
disease or bug that you're going to spread to another part of the country if you ship those plants. So it's really all about controlling um, plant pests. You know, it's not big brother breathing down your neck. And, and all of our members constantly report that when they finally got their inspection, they got to meet their local inspector. Um, it was a wonderful, extremely positive and rewarding experience. I probably have had not, I, I had one inspector for years and years and years, and then he finally retired. So since then, I probably had another three or four inspectors. I've never had an inspector that I've ever had any kind of a problem with. They're always a wealth of information. And they, they come out and they might, you know, they might find that I've got some aphids on, some spirea. They come out and they inspect, and a few days later, I'll get a report in the mail, and it's going to say, you got, you know, you got a, a moderate infestation of aphids on your spirea. Spray with something, you know. They might, they might tell you what to treat it with. It, it's not a big deal. Now, if you were to have something that were horrible, like that hosta uh, X virus or whatever, whatever that thing's called, they're going to red tag your plants and make you get rid of them because it's a very, very lethal thing to other plants. Now, and, and if you want to kind of get a feel for that, there's a show on cable called um, Smugglers. What's the name of that thing? You ever watch it, Dustin? No. You know. It's about it's about people smuggling drugs and stuff into the country, but they but they also have they do segments on agriculture inspectors who are checking people's luggage so they don't bring in cantaloupe that's infested with something from another country and all kinds of food products. They're really all over that because they're diligent about making sure that whatever pest is in another country doesn't come to this country. And the same thing with the United States here on the on the East Coast, especially this part of Ohio. We have two issues here. We have a lot of Japanese beetles and we have gypsy moth. So I have to be inspected for those two things. And if I want to ship my plants into a non-quarantined area of the country, I have to make sure that they are free of those pests. And, you know, I, I have to jump through a, a few hoops to do that. It's not a big deal, but it's all about making sure that when you buy a plant, no matter who you buy it from, you're getting a plant that's healthy and not infested with disease or insects. So yes. You need to be licensed. Now, if you're a, a landscaper or a garden center, the license that you need is a nursery stock dealer's license. And that means that you can buy and sell plants, you're just not growing them. And basically, when you apply for that license, you promise to buy only from people that are licensed and, uh, and, and you're buying from certified growers. So it's, it's really all about the integrity of the industry. The other license that you will need is a, a vendor's license because um, in almost everywhere, plants are taxable. So you have to collect sales tax and remit it to the state. Very, very simple thing to do. But in order to be legitimate, those are the things that you have to do. Okay. Uh, same person had a kind of a, just a different question, but um, they want to know the best propagation timer without... Um, you know, they mentioned the brand that you suggest, but I'm um, saying it's not easy to find, but well, you know, if you wanted to touch on that. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, you know what, Dustin and I share a ton of information. We have over a thousand articles across how many, four or five different websites? Five now, yeah. How many videos on YouTube? Over a hundred? 300 at least now. Is it really? So yeah. we, a ton of information, but one of the things that I don't, I don't share publicly is that that propagation equipment that we sell because I got into trouble a couple of years ago. Some guy called me, you know, he was emailing me, couldn't make it work. He couldn't make it work. And I called him up on a Sunday. I talked to him 20, 30 minutes trying to figure out how to make his stuff work. Finally, I'm like, you know what? I really feel bad. You know, you know, give me your name and address and tomorrow morning we'll send you a complete system there's something wrong with, with what we sent you so i told dustin like hey we got to send this guy a system guess what he didn't even buy the product from us he was cobbling it together from pieces he could find anywhere and then he's calling us for customer support and he was going to allow us to send him a system for free when in fact he did not buy it so that's there's very very few things that we protect and that's one of them so i can't share that publicly uh, we sell that system. What, what's that thing priced at now? Three hundred and twenty-seven dollars. Three twenty-seven. So, it, and it, you know, I, if you don't want to spend that much, I get it. I, I really do. But 
you know, with that system, you have enough you enough stuff to do what probably five ten thousand cuttings, you know, in one season. So it, it's a great investment, and it's a very very effective way to propagate. Now, I'm not telling you that to sell you. I'm just telling you the way it is. I when I first started, I bought a uh, I went I, from a, a, a wholesale growers magazine. I bought a system. I paid more than that for it. I probably paid three hundred seventy-five dollars for it. This was twenty-five years ago, and when I got it, it just didn't work. It didn't. None. No part of it worked the way it was supposed to work. And I pretty much. I think what I salvaged out of that was the valve. I had to go get a different controller. I had to get new mister. So it took us a long time to figure out what works, why it works, and what works in the applications that we're using it out in the open air. And that, that's why we, we just, you know, protect that information. So I, I apologize that I can't really say any more about that, it, you know, publicly. Yeah, so that was, uh, uh, her name was Laura who asked that, and she just put another comment in there and said that she actually bought the one of the old programs years and years ago on old videos. So it was probably where you kind of just listed parts maybe on how to yeah. do it. So with the one that we were, that we had a video on how to do your own one time and, and since then, the, the controller that we now sell is much better. It's much safer because it's completely 24 volt. The controller, actually, there's a transformer in the controller. So the controller is 24 volt. The transformer, actually, the transformer is, is on the cord. But anyway, the power goes directly to the valve. So it's much safer than the system that we talked about many, many years ago. So that's why we, you know, we don't recommend any of that stuff anymore. I don't use that stuff anymore. I use the exact equipment that we sell today. That's what I've been using for a long time. So I just pulled it up real quick on the blog. So people know that if anyone is interested in it, you can buy it online. So if you go to mikespackernursery.com and click recommended tools, uh, not recommended tools, sorry, products. Um, and it's should be in here somewhere, I think. Right here. Right, yeah, my, the automated plant propagation system. So there's a link right there that I think takes you to the actual page that tells you everything about it, what what it comes right. with. So this is in those pictures, or that's our actual system that we're using. So yeah, that's. Um, and again, you know, we're not doing that to sell you. That's up to you. There, you know, we have, and and actually with the in the backyard growing system, Dustin, you have to help me with this because you put this thing together. Uh, but we have a lot of different propagation methods in there, so you don't even have to do that. There's right. Uh, the main the main backyard growing system comes with four four brand new videos that we well brand new when we recorded them. They're not basically exclusive is the best word. They're not anywhere else. And one of those includes uh, propagate like the one of the I can't remember the title of it. The fastest way to to make money with plants, but it's about using a fast propagation method where you, um, I don't remember if it, if it is using that, oh, it's not using that system, but it's something else, but. Um, and there, there's an article on Mike's Backyard Nursery.com uh, called um, easy summer plant propagation techniques. Then there's also one that's called easy winter plant propagation techniques. And there's a lot of information in there about how to use. And actually in, in my book, uh, easy plant propagation, that's all about using an old aquarium to propagate plants. And, you know, today people that aren't may not use the aquarium. They're using a tote from Walmart. So there's a lot of different ways to do it without spending a ton of money on equipment. You, you just don't what have to do that. The, one of the videos I was just looking up to make sure the video is called the simplicity of plant propagation. And, um, three methods of propagation to learn that you don't really you know, to kind of avoid all the other ones that will save you time and money. So, and, and really we've got a member down in, uh, I think it's South Carolina. And I remember when he started a few years ago, he wasn't using any automated propagation. He was just using these methods that we teach in that video or the message I teach in my book. And uh, he swore by that. Well, guess what? This guy just quit his job. His nursery is now his, his full-time business. He's just doing a bang-up business down there with it. So he's been very, very successful. And when he started out, he was not using a lot of expensive equipment. So, All right, next question um, from Cindy. I'd love to know about your Canadian connection um, and says experience in quotes, specifically Ontario. Um, I can't speak 
about the geography of Canada. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to plead ignorant. I don't know where things are in, in Canada, but we do have a number of C Canadian members. We've got a number, a member there. Her name is Barb. I'm not going to, you know, publicly mention her last name, but she's been with us for probably 10 or 15 years, and she does a bang up job. I mean, she sells a ton of stuff. She's in Canada. Then we have several other members that, that are in Canada. I'm not going to tell you that we have a huge following in Canada. We, in the buy, members buy sell area, we actually created a special place for Canadian members to buy and sell plants to and from one another. And it just hasn't taken off the way I would like it to, but it's still there. And we do have Canadians that are, you know, that are with us, you know, on a regular basis. Um, I just don't know exactly where in Canada they're, they're located. But I'll tell you this, um, it, it, Dustin, we, we had that little $7 ebook. I think you told me one time that we had sold that thing in 77 different countries. Yeah, it's probably, point, well, probably well over that. I just didn't, I stopped counting after right. that. So my, my point is this stuff works anywhere there are human beings because people love plants, plants are therapeutic and no matter what the economy does, gardening and plants are an escape from real life so people will always garden right now garden centers the, the prices in garden centers like off the charts what they're charging for things when the economy corrects and i i i'm telling you it's going to happen i've been around long enough to know that it it will happen and you know then where things are going to go into a slump in our in in our little tiny world it doesn't affect us because that means finally we can buy some of this stuff that we've been having a hard time getting our hands on because it's backing up on the wholesale market and we can still sell it for anywhere. You know, I'm encouraging people not to use that 497 model anywhere or 597. I would be at least at 697 to 797 for the smallest of plants because people are more than happy to pay it. They just love being able to come in and fill up a whole cart buy 32 different plants and, and still get away with a very reasonable amount of money compared to going to garden center and every plant you touch is 30, 40 or $50. So um, yeah, it, it's definitely, it works no matter where you're at. If, if there's people there, they're going to buy plants. Okay. Next question. How do you keep deer out of your growing area? Oh boy. That's, you know, that, that's a, a huge thing. And I think, um, you know, this just came up the other day. It comes up a lot in the members area. And one of our customers has a, does really, really well with motion activated sprinklers. So when the deer enter the, the area where the plants are, that motion triggers the sprinklers and they come on and it, it runs the deer off. Other than that, you can spray things, which I don't think is super effective. So you almost have to put up either electric fence or some really high fence. Uh, I don't, I don't know of another good way to do that, but those are the, the recommendations that I'm aware of. Okay, next question from um, Nesli. Thank you for the webinar. Um, do Christmas cacti cuttings need to be rooted before shipping and some general tips on sh shipping in general? Like what are some tips for, sh for shipping plants? And then, uh -huh. and then Nafi, the, the question about rooting. Yeah, the, the Christmas cacti, I, I'm, I'm not, I would think that they should be rooted before shipping, but I'm not, I, I've never grown them, so I really can't speak with any degree of intelligence about that. As far as shipping is concerned, there are a couple, two things, two basic rules of shipping are, number one, you, you've got to keep the roots moist and you want to keep the tops dry because you don't want the tops to get moldy and rotten in transit, but you don't want the plants to dry out. So what I, every time I ship something, what I would do is I would take the roots or wrap them in paper towels and then take the, the whole um, root ball wrapped in paper towels, dip it in a bucket of water, squeeze out excess water, and then stick that, the root ball in a plastic bag and then either tie it, rubber band it, or wrap it up. You know, it doesn't have to be tight, but that way the, the, the roots are going to stay nice and moist in transit. The tops are going to be dry. Um, as far as shipping is concerned, there are regulations as far as, you know, if in other words, if you're on the if you're let's say if you're on the West Coast, you can ship just about anywhere in the country to my knowledge. The West Coast is the most difficult area to ship into because they are the strictest 
about what they're going to allow into their area. And it's all about pest control. That's why they do that. So shipping to the West Coast be, can be kind of tricky, but shipping out of the West Coast is a breeze. If you're on the East Coast, you can ship the entire East Coast and the center, central part of the country almost without a problem. Um, Florida is relatively easy to ship into or ship out of. So, but you, you know, there's a site that's called the National Plant Board, and they tell you all the things that you need to know about shipping. Now, I recommend that you know, one, you know, we talked about this at the beginning of the webinar. You need to be, you really need to be licensed in your state, and you want to get a contact number for your local inspector. That way, when you meet the inspector in person, you can ask that question and he or she is going to say, okay, you got to do this, this, and this, and this. That's what you need to do. And he'll probably, he or she will probably provide you some documentation showing you where you can ship too easily. You know, I remember when I had that conversation with my inspector, he had like A, B, it's A, B, C, I think, you know, areas that um, maybe A, B, C, D. And then, of course, with the West Coast is going to be the most, and not impossible. It's just that they they want, and that you, you soil, there's always a problem. The, you know, nobody wants you sending your soil into their state because there's all kinds of things that hide in the soil. So for the most part, plants are shipped bare root. Not always. If you're going to ship them with, with soil on them, then you, you have to follow the guidelines, uh, you know, a little bit closer. That's all. Uh, regarding like the, the succulents, we, we um, bought like 15 ice plant succulents last, it was actually almost summertime that were not rooted, they were unrooted basically. And they shipped them from Etsy, like somebody on Etsy was selling them. They shipped them unrooted and they did like phenomenally well the whole year until we froze here in Texas in the winter. Well, and that, that's the thing, if you know your product and, and you know how to, to propagate that thing, if you're gonna ship it that way, simply put some instructions in with the package or email your customer with some instructions. Because if you're gonna sell plants to somebody, you want them to be successful with your plants. Then they're going to come back and they're going to buy from you again and again and again. So yeah, they did a good job. They had a little printout that tells you told you what to do, and they even gave a link to go back and give them a review and stuff. So they did right. a good job. Yeah, exactly. They they did do a good job. All right. Next question from Denny in Columbus, Ohio. Do you use any rooting hormones? Uh, Hormo Hormex brand comes in multiple strengths. What do you recommend using? Some people right. eat honey or cinnamon. Um. I'm not, I'm not a big believer in honey and cinnamon and all that. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. My, my take on that is it works because the plant probably would have rooted with no rooting compound at all. So, and I might be wrong about that, but here's my, here's my take. Um, I use either dip and grow or woods uh, rooting compound because it's a liquid, it's a concentrate and if I'm doing softwood cuttings, then I'm going to mix it at a rate of like 20 to one, you know, one part rooting compound to 20 parts of water. If I'm doing a hardwood cutting, I think the, the ratio, it's right in the bottle. Um, I think the ratio is five to one. So five parts water to one part rooting compound. So it's a lot stronger for a hardwood cutting. I use rooting compounds on almost everything I do simply in, in it's overkill. I need, and with, 70, 80% of what we do, it probably, they probably would root fine without it. But I, I use it because I, only, I spend less than $40 a year on rooting compounds. So for me, it just seems crazy not to use it. So that, you know, that's it in a nutshell. It's, it's the least expensive thing, at least the smallest expense that I have in my entire nursery. So I use it on almost everything. I'm going to jump down to like one of the most recent questions because it um, just real quick, somebody they're asking if this is being recorded, it is being recorded and it's going to be uh, probably put it on the YouTube channel, right? Like the public one. Yeah, I think so. So if you're, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, definitely go do that. Um, it's just Mike's backyard nursery on YouTube and um, it should be up there hopefully by tomorrow morning. Okay, next question. Um, this person says, you're leaving California, want to have an income on my land. Where is the best state? Where's the best state with the least intrusion from government to do so? Hmm. Um, and, you know, intrusion from government, I'm not quite sure, you know, what, what you're asking there. Um, in, 
I don't, for the most part, what we do, government is our friend because they make sure that nobody sends me plants that are going to kill everything in my, on my farm. So that to me, you know, I, my, my suggestion, if you want to grow and sell small plants, then it, you can, you, you want to pick an area where the climate is conducive to doing that. And you definitely do not want to be in a city or a village because that's government that kind of can make your life crazy because they have so many rules. Typically in a township somewhere, um, like I'm in the township, the township, they're very, very, they're great people. They don't stick their nose in every little thing you do. You know, they, you know, um, and those are things that you want to research ahead of time and find out what their zoning laws are um, and whether or not you can sell from home, things like that. So that, that's the kind of research that you want to do. Um, the other thing that, you know, if you're going to grow things in the ground, you, you want really good soil that's well-drained, that's conducive to good nursery stock. But growing in the ground is, that's a real production. You know, you got to put the stuff in the ground, you have to keep the soil cultivated, you got to keep the weeds at bay, and then you have to harvest things out of the ground. And Dustin will tell you, <laughs> harvesting things out of the ground is real work. We've, we've done it many, many times, and it's just flat out real work. I haven't done it in, in a couple of years, but my back still hurts from that. <laughs> Compared to putting plants in a little tiny, uh, like a four by five container where you can pick up and carry three of them at a time and walk to the customer's car and each one of them is worth $7.97 a piece. It just doesn't get better than that. I can grow, put things in the ground and get 80, 90, $150 for something, but I got to hire somebody to, to dig it and they're going to charge me but it's not so much what they're going to charge me. It's finding somebody to do that. I'm lucky. I'm surrounded by, you know, a lot of uh, nurseries around here. So there's always workers that are willing to come over and, you know, um, dig things for me on a piecework type basis, which is fine. But it's still, you know, something I have to coordinate. I got to go get burlap and baskets and all that kind of stuff. It's just not a part of the business that I want to be in. I, I really like doing the small plants that I can pick up, you know, three in each hand and walk to the car with. Okay, next question from Jason. Do you uh, do you do burning bush any different from other plants or do you use different soil medium? All, all my other varieties of plants are growing great. The burning bush started leafing out, then the leaves started falling off. Um, all right, it, I wanna, burning bush is kind of weird if you are in a warmer state, you know, like a eight, nine or something, you're in Texas or someplace. This is. People have, have had burning bush shipped to them and the, the plants will stay, will be alive, but they don't leaf out. So if you're in a warmer climate, that could be the issue because burning bush is really, really simple. I mean, it's a very fibrous rooter. We, we don't do anything special with it. We root them, you know, in June uh, in our propagation area and they root like crazy. Uh, it takes about six weeks to root them if the, if the wood is really soft. Now, if you let the wood get harder, it's gonna take a lot longer to root them, but you can root them as hardwood cuttings. You may only get about a 75 or 80% success rate. So, but that would, that's the question I have is if, if they're not doing well for you, it could be where you're trying to grow them at. Um, So this is more of a support thing, but I can't, I'm just going to have to say it on here. Um, Meg, can you just shoot me an email at uh, MikeDustin at gmail.com and I, I'll be able to help you out there. Or you can reply to uh, any email yeah. that you got from us. Yep. Any, any emails that you get from us will go to me eventually. One unless, it, unless it's from our shopping cart, then that, that won't go directly to us, but it should, but it, yeah, it, okay. maybe not. Um, uh, yeah, where is a good place to go or a resource to get propagation tips on each plant? Like Mike said, some are best hardwood, some are best softwood, semi-hardwood as far as cuttings. Like when you have two or 300 different varieties, do you just try and look up each one or is there somewhere to go? Well, you know, I am not, we're not doing this to sell you on our members area, but I'm going to tell you that for you, we, we allow people, we only open it up every, a few times a year. It's not open all the time, but in the members area, you can ask any question you want 
and get you will get an answer from not it's way different than the rest of the internet because you're getting an answer from people that do this all day every day and do it to make money compared to going to a gardening forum where you're going to get all kinds of random crazy things that don't make any sense so you can test drive our members area for seven dollars for 30 days and that, that's all I want you to spend. If you, and, and I'm not telling you to do that, but I'm telling you if you do, it's going to be the best $7 you ever spent in a 30-day period. And then after 30 days, we're going to start billing you. But all you got to do is email Dustin and say, hey, I'm not ready to do this right now. You know, please make sure that I don't get charged, you know, for the members area, cancel my membership. Boom. That's it. He will pause your payments, stop them, whatever. So that's a, it's a great resource. But to answer your question without going to the members area, in the back of my Easy Plant Propagation book, I've got a section called How to Do What, and it kind of lists a whole bunch of different plants and whether to do them softwood or hardwood. And I also think we have that. Where do we have that? On it's, on, it's on freeplants.com as an article, I think. Yeah, so freeplants.com was a website that I did initially way back in 1999. And there we call that article, uh, what propagation technique for which plant or something. I don't I'll know. Pull it up. I'll pull it up real quick. Cause it's under, I think it's under propagation. Propagation calendar. Yeah. Well, no, no, I don't think so. That, So actually, if you go to plant propagation of basics, which is up near the top of the screen right there, I think there's going to be all kinds of links down a little bit. Yeah, I think there's going to be all kinds of links in that article that are going to take you to all, to all the different things that you need to know. Either that or I'm making that up. Yeah, rip. Yeah, so that, that's, but anyway, um, I could try and search it, but I, I can't multitask and I'm going to get lost. Plus, Is it do it doing now or no? How to do what? How, yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, know why that's, that's probably it. <laughs> yeah, that kind of lists a bunch of different ones. Right. Folks, I did this in 23 years ago. So <laughs> and I, I don't go there and look at, at this stuff very often. So. But I got I got this pulled up too because she also I didn't even get a chance to ask the second part of her question about is there a did she miss a non patented plants list somewhere and that's that's this list right yeah that list is pretty extensive it doesn't show like she also asked what best way to propagate them it doesn't say that on there really not but, not here yeah. Um, but that's a that's a huge list, so I'm not yeah. going to go all the way down. The, the short the short answer is almost everything could does really well is a softwood cutting done. Like in Ohio, we start our softwood cuttings in June. If you're in like uh, Tennessee, you might start yours the middle of May. So softwood cuttings are a great place to start. Some kind of some trees and things need to be done from seed. Um, so yeah, some some things are going to take a little bit of research, but again. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to pitch the members area, but I want you to know how valuable it is because you can get these answers, you know, almost instantly there, I mean, you know, at least within a matter of hours. But if you go there and just read the post and follow along what everybody's doing every day, what you learn is just incredible. And you know what? It's for some people. It's not for everybody. So, um, but if you're curious and you're willing to invest seven dollars and then, you know, are, are willing to email Dustin and tell him that you want to cancel after your 30 days or before your 30 days is up, that's fine. We're, we're fine with that. We, we want people to experience it because it is a, a godsend for some people, maybe not so much for others. So, Okay, next question. Uh, thank you guys for doing this. I'm in a very cold northern Minnesota and want to sell trees. What would you recommend starting with? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I... Well, trees. Boy, that, that's a that's a big question. First of all, you you want to sell things that are that are normally sold in your climate. So go to the garden centers and look and see what they're selling, what people are buying, what people are interested in. Um, and you know, trees are such a 
I guess it depends on what size trees, because when you start putting trees in the field, we're right back to that harvesting thing. We're getting them out of the field and onto a truck and into the customer's hand is, you know, I would not recommend that somebody with no experience start there because that that can be a pretty, pretty challenging thing. But if you wanted to grow things like trees from seed, like dogwoods and bread buds and, and birch trees and things like that, and, and sell them bare root, you know, in a box, um, that, that, that's a great market. Great, great, great market. You know, we have people that do really well with that. But I don't know that I answered your question. The other thing you can do, I'm sure there's, there's always going to be a big market for evergreen trees. You know, things that look like a Christmas tree, but not necessarily sold as Christmas trees, sold uh, landscape size to, um, uh, you know, landscapers basically are the ones that are going to buy that. When homeowners buy them, we got a guy here locally that sells a lot of them to homeowners, but they also provide delivery and planting, which I bet that they probably deliver and plant 90% of what they sell because, you know, trees are, trees are work. They're big. Uh, next question. Is it too late to stick hardwood arborvita in zone 6B? Uh, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to say it, it might not be, but I think you would be better off to wait because even if you, let's say you stuck them in January, which would have been a better time, they're going to be very slow to root. But if you wait and do them at uh, like the end of July, they're probably going to be rooted before winter sets in. So whether you do them now as a hardwood or do them in July as a softwood, they're probably still going to be rooted at the same time. It, it doesn't cost you anything. It's not going to hurt anything to try them now they're they're going to root for you so do do them both ways next question can you ship the propagation system to canada we we can but it's expensive and how do we do that before did somebody go to yeah, like their... really the best way to do it is to email email me so that i can figure out the ship the extra shipping cost ahead of time that way you can just make one payment at one time um uh, we've had it probably ranged anywhere from $40, an extra $40 to an extra $80, depending on where in Canada. I remember we did it then. It, it was expensive. Yeah, it's mostly like, it's not, it's not a heavy product. It's just a, the, the cubic space, I think on the truck is part of the, the deal. Right. It, the box is, you know, 30 by 10 by 10. And that, that's today with every, with all the shipping that's going on, you, you pay a premium for the amount of space that you take up in a, in a truck. Um, all right, this is Harry. What, uh, what channels do you use to find customers and close sales without having a retail location? Okay, here we go again. Mike pitch in the members area. <laughs> and, and, and I hate to go there, but Dustin will tell you um, that, and I, and I firmly believe this with all of my heart, that there's still a ton of opera, even though like we hit right before this webinar started, Dustin and I were chatting and we were, I was in the, in the members area looking around in the buy sell area. And right now there's a, a, well, not a ton of ads. There's what a page and a little bit. So yeah. but we only leave an ad up for seven days. So things turn really, really quickly. And a lot of things sell out quickly, but uh, I think that's a great area to specialize. In other words, I, you know, earlier in the webinar, I mentioned things like the silver dollar hydrangea that, you know, we got a bunch of members that have those available. We got a guy that does Ruby slippers hydrangea and every time he puts them up, they sell. Um, so depending on the item, if you're going to do something that's really generic and everybody else is already doing, you know, probably not. But the point is, and this is what happens is, when, when people, you know, they get involved with us and then they finally get ready and they have their first sale, the first words out of their mouth is, holy cow, we had a great weekend. I wish I had more plants. So then they go to the members area and they start buying things like crazy. So I, and I'm not just saying this, you can, you know, you can invest $7 and watch it for yourself. But for the most part, things sell really, really well in there and they sell quickly at wholesale price. I mean, we're not, you know, I don't want people in there selling at retail price and our members won't pay retail price. They know what the wholesale price should be. But, you know, I remember one time we had a lady from Washington, she put some ferns on there. I don't remember what she had them priced at, but she completely sold out $1,400 worth of ferns in 20 minutes. I've got two other members 
you know, that have sold, oh boy, um, I, I don't want to mention names, but you know who I'm talking about, Dustin, and he has done hundreds of thousands of dollars in our members area. And then we got another guy in the South has probably done hundreds of thousands of dollars in there. So um, it, I'm not going to tell you you're going to get rich, but other avenues outside of the members area, um, we, people sell plants on eBay, people sell plants on Craigslist. Um, and then there's, you know, mainstream wholesale, where if you're producing a good quality liner that's up to industry standards, there's wholesale growers that are going to buy from you. You know, not, not a guarantee, but it, it happens all the time. We got a, a local nursery here. They're big, they're a really big outfit. But every once in a while, he will send out, the vice president will send out an email. He's like, hey, I've got, you know, a surplus on these hosta. So we, they divided their hosta. And I can't remember what I was, but anyway, I bought I, six, 800 hosta from him. I bought, last fall, I bought a bunch of uh, Rudy Haig dwarf burning bush, which is a really dwarf burning bush from him. Cause he like, hey, I got too many, who wants them? So he sent me emails to all the growers in the area and boom, they're, they're gone like that. So um, there are avenues, you know, retail sales are great, but that's not for everybody. And if you're in an area where zoning is an issue, you don't want to attract a lot of attention doing things like that. So I would start out relatively small and start the members area is a good place to, to test your, you know, your shipping and so on there. Um, and kind of pick a few things that you, you think are going to be, you know, in demand. Um, and we can, you know, we can talk about that inside the members area because there inside the members area, there's nothing that's not up for discussion. We, you know, we, we, and in our members, you will find our members are, it's not like other places in the internet. Dustin and I do not let people hate on each other. You know, you will get booted so fast, your head will spin if you're going to come in there and just be mean to people. We just don't allow that, I mean, period. And we don't allow people to argue. We don't do religion. We don't do politics. We do plants. That's what we do on that. So it, Dustin... I rambled. What else did I miss as far as uh, being able to? Well, I mean, that's around? mostly it. There, and, I mean, there's tons and tons of marketplaces popping up all over the internet that will allow you to sell things. You know, Etsy, like I said earlier, was one of the places I personally bought some succulents from. Little shops like that are, you know, they're gaining a lot of traction because it's just quick and easy. And then they make it easy for for you, the, the person selling the stuff to, to do business. So. And, and here's, you know, I've got a friend who he actually is a member and a customer of ours, but he also came from a big wholesale perennial operation that, that closed up um, only because the owner of this real estate got so valuable that he just, you know, could not not sell it. I mean, it was worth millions and millions of dollars where it was located. Um, but, you know, he was growing a lot of stuff in his backyard and he gave me some stuff and I bought some stuff from him and he bought stuff from us. And then I talked to him about a year ago and he says, you know, me and my buddy, we started doing some ornamental grasses and just selling divisions. And we uh, rented a booth at a wholesale trade show. And he said, we have not been able to keep up since. So that's a, a big avenue. You know, these wholesale trade shows are mind boggling with what happens in those places. So I always recommend to our members to, you know, if you have an opportunity, get your butt to a wholesale trade show. Now, in September, we are doing an event with our members here in Ohio, and we're we're going we're going to a small trade show, but it's at a at a large wholesale nursery, so it's going to be a real eye opening experience there too. So, you know that you know we're we'll be talking about that a lot in the members area as we get closer to September. So. All right, next question from Keith. Um, here in Kansas, it is windy. I think watering at night is not the best time. Do you have any ideas on what I can do to block the wind or timing so the uh, propagation beds uh, are going to grow properly? Well, as far as propagation, if you're trying to root things, you have to water midday. You, you, you just have to. So um, <clears throat> probably the easiest way to, to block wind is just to put up um, – you know, just, just drive some stakes and then put up 
like the like the silt fence material that you see all over the country where they have to put it up around a construction zone to keep silt from washing into the streets and into the storm sewers that type of material will make or i buy mesh tarps from um, uh, harbor freight and on amazon but they're they are 12 I think 12 by 16. So that's probably too big for what you want. But if you can buy that construction material in a 48 inch roll and attach that to some stakes and, and that product, because you definitely want, you definitely have to do, you know, uh, miss your cuttings during the day. Now, as far as watering other things, I, a lot of times I have my irrigation come on at 5 a.m. and let it run, you know, my irrigation cycles. Um, it, it runs for five minutes and then it's off for three. And then it, I run four different zones and so then it'll go to different zones. So it takes about two, two and a half hours to water everything, but the stuff gets water over a period of time. So by the time the sun comes up, everything is really nice and wet. And then if it's really a hot part of the, the summer, then I'll have it run again at 5 p.m. That way you're, it's got a chance to dry out before the sun goes down. So yeah, there, those are, there are ways around that. All right, next question from Ryan. Hi, Mike, I live in uh, South Carolina zone 8A. On my property, the only area I have for propagation has a Southern exposure. If I use a shade cloth raised over the propagation box, can I still propagate softwood cuttings that are covered with a white greenhouse plastic? Um, I... I'm not sure why you do the, the shade and the white. Well, if he's not if he's not going to use like a mist type propagation, then you know maybe that's yeah. I mean the, the the white plastic is going to reflect the sun pretty well. The shade cloth is going to work really well. We just had a member post something where she erected shade cloth at probably like a forty five degree angle, so her uh, propagation area was underneath of there, and it was actually pretty clever. At, you know, and I, I told her I'm like it's it's actually way neater looking than my hillbilly setup that I used to to shade my my cutting. So, but that's what I use to shade my cuttings are those mesh tarps from Harbor Freight or Amazon because they come with grommets that are like thirty bucks a piece. And they well, they were who knows, but they were thirty bucks a piece when I bought them a couple of years ago. All right, next question. How much time should you expect to spend per week or month tending every 10 square feet, for example? Is propagation something one can do successfully on a very part-time basis? Well, how, how big of an area? Well, they're saying basically like how much time for a square, like a 10 foot square foot area, like per 10 foot square. Well, actually the, the propagation is very easy because, you know, I stick, all of my cuttings, I start sticking cuttings in June, early June, and then I, I, I'm not in love with sticking cuttings, so I get as many hands involved as I can, and then we get them done in a matter of two, three, four, or five days, and then, then we're done. And then I don't touch them. I don't, I don't have to do anything to them for weeks until, actually, the, the cuttings that I stuck last June are still in the bed, in the sand, uncovered, exposed. They've been, they've been frozen. They've been snowed on. They've been rained on. They've been had freezing rain on them. They're fine. Either, you know, so we will start getting them out of there this spring and, and potting them up. And I will do so on an as-need basis. I, I, I'm rooting them in sand so I can get them out of there without doing a lot of root damage because I just scoop up a whole handful of cuttings with the sand. And then a lot of times what I'll do is I will, yeah, that's exactly, that bed is the bed that I'm using now. We took that picture a number of years ago, but that's, you know, that's exactly where my cuttings are stuck that I did this year. So, um, but anyway, I can scoop them up out of there. So a lot of times if I'm, if I'm going to pass something in like July or August, I'll scoop them up out of there and then I'll bunch them up, put them in a container and put them in a shaded area and let them harden off a little bit, just in case I did do some root damage before I pot them up. So it, you do it at your pace. Don't, you know, this is your business. It's your pace. It's your amount of whatever you want to do. All right. Next question, I believe, is about the members area. It just says, how do you join and what is the cost? So you probably haven't really told them how to join, but you, we definitely covered the cost. So, Right. It costs. The, the, there's two ways to join. You can take a $7 trial for 30 days to find out whether or not you, that's what you want to do. And that includes recurring billing. 
So if you take the $7 trial, 30 days from now, we're going to start charging you $67 a month, but we only charge you that for nine months. So I think it comes out to about $618 or something if you make the payments. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's not nine, it's $7 and then nine payments of $67 each. Or there's a one-time payment of $497. And, and we even offer a money-back guarantee on that, don't we? Yeah, so the one-time payment has the guarantee just because you're not really getting the trial like everyone else. Um, and that, so just this page is backyardgrowers.com slash join. That's that's the, the how part of how you, how you join. And it explains the two different options here. Yeah, so it says that the, the $497 option, you've got 60 days. If, if after 60 days, you think you made a mistake, email Dustin and we'll, we'll refund your money. Yep. Um, this, the $7, you know, the $7 <laughs> option, you got 30 days. And then after 30 days, we start charging you $67 a month. Um, and you can, you can stop anytime you want. I mean, we're not really offering refunds there because that's, we're, you know, we're giving you the option to get out before you get billed. Um, but you can stop anytime you want. And then even if you want to start back up, you know, we're not jerks. You know, if you made four payments, you know, we let you make five more. And then, but the beauty of that is once you're paid up, you're a permanent member. We, like I mentioned earlier, we've got two members that have been with us for what well, we got, we got, you know, probably hundreds and hundreds of members have been with us for a long, long time, but we got members that have been with us, paid us $700, probably didn't even pay that because it was a long time ago. We weren't charging that way back then. And they sell tens of thousands of dollars worth of plants there on a regular basis and they've never paid us another dime. So, um, and, and that's, that's the thing. I mean. A lot of people don't, they're confused with the payments. I think a lot of times and. It is just it's seven dollars for the trial, then only nine payments. That's it. And it like if like you said, if you made you could just make two payments. All you can do this year is two payments. Just do two. Email me. I'll pause it. I've had people pause it for two or three years, come back and then start payments again at that third payment. So um, you don't have to start your payments over. It's once you make a payment one, that payment's done forever. You know, our, our primary goal, first of all, the membership is expensive because it's worth it. It is, it is, years ago, we used to sell our growing system for $297. A membership was $298. So it's actually more difficult to get involved back then. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible. We have to charge that because, you know, we put a billion hours into this thing, keeping it running and putting it all together. And I'm in there every single day managing, you know, answering questions and, ma you know, managing the boards. Dustin's in there all the time, hand, you know, doing all that. So, you know, it's not, we earn the money, but um, it, it's a great value. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. Let Dustin know you won't, you know, you'll pay $7. And if, if money's tight, you know, I, I remember, um, I had a guy that joined a long time ago and he's like, okay, now I'm in here. How am I going to make enough money to make that $67 payment every month? And of course me and any other members threw out all these different ideas. Well, this guy is in Arizona and he has done incredibly well. I mean, his plant sales were, you know, thousands and thousand dollar weekends. So yeah, he, he was very reluctant getting in, um, but it was money well spent for him. I mean, you know, I had a gal in Tennessee years ago, and she's like, well, Mike said that if I don't like it, he'll give me my money back. So I bought the grow system. She turned out to be one of the best growers that we ever had. And today, we don't hear from her very often because she's off in her own little world, grafting Japanese ma maples and selling them wholesale. That That's what she does. She, you know, that that's what her business turned into. So... Um, you know, the, the beauty of this, though, you get to meet these other members. There's people next near you. You can visit them. You can visit their operations. We just had a guy. He's in uh, Cranesville, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, western Pennsylvania, only about an hour from me. He just took a trip down south and visited. I don't know. Did you see his post, Dustin Rogers? He did. No. He did. He visited uh, three or four of the wholesale growers that a lot of us do business with. Then he visited a, a number of members along the way. Um, so yeah, that, you know, people do that all the time. Um, and, and, and we encourage it. We want you to interact with, you know, members that are in your area. 
All right, next question from Terry. Aside from digging it up, what's the best way to limit bamboo intrusion beyond a machete? Um, you know, digging it up, but is a guy who grows bamboo told me that the best way to maintain bamboo in an area that, you know, to keep it where it's supposed to be is mowing. If you keep it mowed down as soon as it pops up, then it's not going to spread, you know, uh, 10 miles like it could. But I, I don't know. I mean, if you've already got it, then you know what you're dealing with. Um, it, it can be challenging. But I, I think, but you know, my dad, somebody gave my dad some bamboo years ago and he planted it at the end of the house and that patch kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it never really outgrew where he mowed. So according to what, you know, this grower told me that, that that probably works, you know, plants need to photosynthesize in order to thrive. And if you keep cutting their heads off, then they're, they're not going to be happy about that. So I'm not going to guarantee it, but that's my answer. Okay, another question. What would you recommend to get started right away and how soon would it be ready to go? I'm in Northeast Oklahoma. You know, it, it, the easiest thing to do to get started is to buy liners, whether you buy them from one of our members or where you buy them wholesale somewhere else and get them potted up. And you can, you actually, you know, if I sold you 10 liners today, you could pot them up tomorrow. And with some pictures, post those to, you know, we sell a lot of stuff through Facebook. All of our members do. They use the marketplace. And, you know, guess what? I have people tell, tell them, I, I hate Facebook. I don't use, you know what, that's up to you. But I don't like Facebook either. But I use Facebook because it works really, really well. And Dustin and I have done videos about how to, you, you know, make your Facebook ads, your Facebook posts work really, really well. And, you know. Um, What's it, probably want to explain what a liner is to people too. A, a liner, a rooted cutting is exactly what it is. It's a, it's a stick with roots on it and a few leaves at the top. A liner is a rooted cutting that has been grown out that, you know, for like a, a full growing season. So it's got a much stronger root system and then it's starting to branch out a little bit. The term comes from years ago, a liner was something that was hardy enough to line out in the field and not have it die immediately because it was too small and frail. So a liner is a small plant that is well rooted and, and starting to branch. Next question. Yeah. Oh, go yeah. ahead. So if you now you, if you buy liners, let's say you you buy ten liners, silver silver dollar hydrangea. All you have to do is, is post that on your on your Facebook page or hand out flyers in the neighborhood to people you know and people you work with. They are going if you have good pictures, they are going to want that plant for eight bucks. Put it in a container, let it root in a little bit. They're going to be sold before they're ready to sell. But if you keep half of them, you can start taking cuttings off of those things. And, um, you know, now you've got constant stock that you're taking cuttings from. Silver dollar hydrangea was something that I wanted to start growing. I went to one of our members, a gal down in Georgia, who does really, really well. She's like, I don't have any liners, but I have five bigger plants. I'll send them to you. She wouldn't even take my money. She, You've done enough for me here. You know, so she sent them to me. I planted them, you know, along the donkey fence. Um, I took cuttings off of them. So last, no, the fall before last, I took 25 of them and I planted them on what we call Donkey Hill. And last summer I took cuttings off of all the ones on the driveway and all the ones on Donkey Hill. Now I have three or 400 silver dollar hydrangea rooted. The, the ones on Donkey Hill are going to explode with new growth this spring. So now I have an endless supply of, of what am I, what am I talking about? Hydrangea, um, silver dollar, silver dollar hydrangea. So, yeah. So now I have an endless supply of silver holler, silver dollar hydrangea. I also put in, in that same bed. I put in pink diamond, phantom and tardiva hydrangea on donkey Hill. I put in Ruby slippers hydrangea. So now I, I'm going to have an endless supply of all those things. So you don't want to sell the golden goose. If you buy 10 liners, Keep at least three or four so you can take cuttings from them, sell the rest, recoup your money, go buy more liners, and just keep doing, you keep turning things that way, and, and you'll do fine. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show this real quick. This was actually an interview that we did with one of our growers from Wyoming. And this, this is actually a very low, low estimate as far as dollar amount. She sold 
down here, what is it? Sharon uh, bought a box of 1500 bare root strawberry plants from one of our, the wholesale sources we, we recommend. And she sold all of them in six days. So she basically just used like the wholesale method to, to sell them. She flipped them. Yep. She, she bought them and flipped them and, and, and did $1,500. So, you know, and we have people do that all the time. And we have, uh, you know, for instance, Japanese maples. There, there's a, a Japanese, there's a, a grower in the country that sells bare root Japanese maples for probably around two, two and a quarter a piece. But they have a really high minimum that is, it makes it difficult for other people to buy, you know, because they don't want to, I think their minimum is like $700, $750. But we have growers that'll make order that and then mark them up a little bit and sell them to other members. So you'll you see that all the time where you know and it's it, it's there's nothing wrong with it because you're doing people a favor. You're you're giving a, you're giving a person a chance to buy 10, 20, or 30 Japanese maples for maybe three dollars a piece, you know. So yeah, we, we have people that, that that broker and flip plants all the time. All right, next question. Is it good to have a specialty or just grow what people want or both? I think both. I think that you're going to want to grow, you know, you want to start out, you want to do things that, that flower and are in demand, people like that way you can turn some cash, you can get some things growing, but then it's not going to hurt at all to become notorious for a one particular plant, especially in, in, you know, the more difficult something is to grow, the better it's going to sell down the road. I mean, I've been telling people for years, you know, you, you should be doing some Dorif Alberta spruce. You should be doing rhododendrons. You know, that Ruby, Ruby Slippers hydrangea is selling like crazy. So um, it, it doesn't, and I think a lot of our members end up kind of being the, becoming the specialist for certain plants accidentally because it's just something they got good at and they did a bunch of. So yeah, I, I, I think you want to try and do, eventually do both. All right, the next question is, uh, I'm just going to pull this up for reference about the, the trial, when you do the 30 day trial, can you make purchases? So when you when you do the 30 day trial, you have full access, just like every other member, you can, you know, it's the same as being a permanent member during that trial. You, there are no restraints on what you can do. You, you have the same access to everybody that, that's a member. So that's, that's this option here on the left, if you, yeah. you know, are interested in that. So yes, you, you can make purchases. You do not have to be licensed to buy plants in our members area. You do have to be licensed to sell them. We don't want people coming in there and selling stuff that they dug up out of their neighbor's yard and that hasn't been inspected. It might be infested with stuff. So, you know, we want, we want to maintain the integrity of our, of our buy sell area, but you know, you don't have to be licensed. And this is a, a, this goes way back to a question that somebody asked earlier. And I don't think we completely answered about licensing. You don't have to be licensed until you are ready to sell your plants. Now, um, a lot of these government agencies, even before COVID, were cutting back. So the inspectors were having a hard time getting around. So you, you want to apply for your license and your first inspection about six months before you're ready to sell. That way, you've got plenty of time um, to give the inspector a, a chance to come around. Now, when I say inspector, don't start shaking in your boots. We've never had anybody um, come back to the board and said, my inspector was a miserable you-know-what, because that, that's just not what happens. They're, they're usually very, very friendly. They're very informative. Uh, they're extremely knowledgeable, and they help you identify things on your plants that you may not know yourself. So, um, Nursery inspectors are great people, and our members have very, very good things to say about the inspectors that come to their places. So, so, so anyway, you don't have to have that license until you're ready to start selling, but don't wait till the last minute. Next question. I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado, trying to start a vineyard. Any suggestions? Um, well, I'm not an expert on a vineyard, but we do have members that do a lot of great plants. Um, and uh, oh man, the guy in the Erie, I don't know how many does he see? He sells so many every spring, it's unbelievable. I can't remember what his number is, but it's tens of thousands of yeah. great plants, you know. Um, and I, I don't know what, I, I want to say around $2 a piece for most of the varieties, but I'm, but I'm not sure. But other than that, I don't know that I have a lot of information about starting a vineyard. You know, that's, 
I, I, I've made a lot of grape cuttings. I used to, I used to get paid to make 5,000 grape cuttings a day. That was my job. So I've, I've done that end of it, but I've not done the actual vineyard part. All right. Uh, next question. I'm starting a plant hobby and I'm so confused about fertilizing. Some say once a month or six months or one year, also liquid versus dry and all purpose. Can you help clarify? Um, yeah, you know what? That's something that people really like to just confuse the daylights out of. I am a very much a keep it simple kind of guy. So we use a slow release fertilizer on all of our, everything that we pot up, whether it's in a, quart, a small quart container or a two quart container or a one gallon container, um, like the, 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 the two quarts and the one gallons, they get one tablespoon of slow release fertilizer at the time that we plant them. That's it. They're not getting any more fertilizer for at least 12 months. And then in 12 months, they're going to get another tablespoon of slow release fertilizer. If it's a quart, we're probably going to put in a half to three quarters of a tablespoon of slow release fertilizer. So I use, right now I'm using Osmocote. 18512. So that's 18% nitrogen, um, 5% five, 5 uh, phosphorus, and 12% potash. I think I got that the right order. I haven't thought about that in years. Um, and it, but, it, but when I say slow release, that's a five month release. So even though it's 18% nitrogen, it's going to, it takes five months for those little pellets to completely release that nitrogen. So the plants get fed for a period of five months. That's based on an average temperature of 70 degrees. So the colder, the slower the re release, the warmer. But anyway, that, that's all we do. You know, others use liquids, but they confuse themselves. And then others, you know, we have some members that have an a injector system where they're injecting liquids into the, that's all fine and well, but I don't complicate things in my world like that, you know. And people come and they look at my plants and they think they're absolutely amazing. So, um, what, what I do works. It, the, the truth is the fertilizer isn't as important as the growing medium. And the most important thing about the growing medium is that it has to be aerated and breathe. If it's heavy and sticky, your plants are not gonna be happy. You, you know, So we grow in a, a combination of pine bark and compost so that when we pour water in that container, it pretty much runs through. The compost retains a little bit of it, but all the excess runs through. That's what plants like is a very loose, because plants have to be able to get oxygen through the soil to the roots. And if you have a heavy, a heavy soil, that's not gonna happen. All right, next question. Um, thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. I've been considering this uh, endeavor in our area for uh, close, well, same latitude as you, but in the high desert, high elevation Sierra Nevada mountains on the Nevada, California border. I'm wondering if there are any other growers might be located in this harsh environment where we must try to use very little water and any folks in the group who try specializing native plants to encourage pollinators. Uh, we, we do have people that grow a lot of natives. The one guy that I think of is in Georgia and we do have people that are in the high desert climate that just came up a couple of days ago. So that, that is challenging because, you know, you've got lower humidity and, uh, you know, less, less available water. So yeah, we do, you know, we do have people that are doing that. I think the most important thing, if you're thinking about, about doing that in no matter where you're at, doing this no matter where you're at, is to take a day and go visit as many growers and garden centers and nurseries as you can. And then just ask as many questions as they will let you get away with. Some of them are going to kind of find out you're picking their brain and they're going to be get rude and abrasive. Others are going to be like, hey, you know, hey, buddy, I'll help you out here. This is what I do, you know. So people are people, but um, that, that's one, one good way to, to go about that. So uh, next question. So natives and pollinators, that's a big thing. You know, people are going to be very interested in that. And they are those sold on the board? That was the, that. The last part of that question that I left out. Like yeah, I mean, like, you know, like, like Greg down in Georgia, he sells a ton of stuff that's native on the board. His his nursery got a native nursery, and I think we've got a a page on Mike's backyard nursery. Um, you know, a feature we did a feature on his place. I don't remember the name of it though, but there's a search box, and if you search yeah. Greg in Georgia, it's probably going to come up for natives. You know. Or even just Georgia probably will 
pull up the, all the, the ads or whatever right. in Georgia that we have on there. Our next question, as I understand, you buy the plants, pot them, which requires a pot and soil. At the end of the day, what is the average profit percentage, I guess, uh, per plant? If you're going to buy a rooted cutting, you're probably going to spend about a buck and a quarter. If you're going to buy a liner, you're probably going to spend around two dollars. Perennials, uh, wholesale on a perennial can be anywhere from 89 cents to two dollars and fifty cents, depending on what you're buying and what size you're buying and whether or not it's it's patented and has a royalty attached to it and all of that. <clears throat> the containers used to be like a one gallon container, uh, you know, decent price was 25 cents. Right now, like everything else in the country, uh, the price of containers has gone up. So they're going to be probably in the 35, 40 cent range, you know, but you should be getting at least $8 for that plant, $7.97. So the soil in the container is probably going to, let's say soil is 50 cents, you know, so you're going to have two or $3 in it as a the high end. And then you can sell it for, for $8. But other things you can sell bare root and you have, you're, you're no soil, no container, nothing, just bare root and ship it to somebody in a box. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. All right. Next question is when will your program be available in Australia? <laughs> Uh, I, I, this is from Deb, and I think Deb, you've talked to me many times via email, trying to get it to go through on our system. And sometimes it works for people out of the, the U.S. Sometimes it just doesn't. So um, if you email me, we'll we'll figure out a way to get you access because it's just it, the the Becker growing system is a 100% digital product. Now you can access it as long as you have a computer and internet connection, you'll be able to, to access everything. Um, it's just our shopping cart sometimes doesn't play well with orders outside of the country. And that's all because of fraudulent stuff. So there, there are controls in there that, you know, try and keep everybody out of trouble. Um, but I, I'll tell you this, we, we've had customers, you know, we've had customers in, you know, Australia and New Zealand and, you know, they, they did incredibly well. I, I wish that I had the opportunity to interact with them more, but, you know, we, we just haven't. So, and a lot of them don't join our members area because our members area is based on a lot of buying and selling coming from one another and you know shipping across international borders doesn't work all that well unless you're doing a, a big order you know uh, next question from tim what do i add to hardwood bark chips to make the potting soil what would what would be a general turnaround time to have bark chips ready for potting mix well, you want to, you want to, if you're going to use hardwood bark, you want to find some that is as fine as possible. And, you know, maybe if you found it a year old, that would be ideal. Um, you, you know, you, you got to start with, with what you got to start with. So I would, you know, but what you're going to add to it, you don't, don't do sand. At one time I used sand and recommended it, but you know, the sand actually seeps in and fills all the pores. So that's not a, a good thing. Maybe a little, a little bit of pea gravel and a little bit of compost. Like, you know, if you had 75% um, bark and uh, 10, 10, maybe 15% compost and just a little bit of pea gravel to offer, add some drainage. If you can find pine wood bark, now a lot of places you can buy, they call it soil conditioner, it's sold in bags in the big box stores. And if you open it up, it's just pine bark chips. You can grow in fresh pine bark. You can grow in fresh hardwood bark too, but you know, it, it might be a little, little bit more challenging, but the, the fresh pine bark is fine. And right. I, there's articles on uh, uh, Mike's Backyard Nursery about all kinds of different potting soil mixes and blends and stuff. Yeah, there's a couple different good blog posts in there. Right. Next question, uh, is there a, the best treatment for spider mites? Well, I guess it depends on what you're treating, you know, what, what you have spider mites on. Um, most growers that, that have spider mite infestations it will use uh, some kind of a miticide, and I, I don't know the, the, the brand names, you know, but then they will actually alternate because they claim that, you know, that one mite that then is going to become resistant to what you're using. So they alternate um, 
<clears throat> for me, it's never, I, I grew dwarf Alberta spruce in a bed. I, you know, one time I had about a thousand of them in a bed and, and I had a moderate infestation of spider mites, but it was never an issue. You know, spider mites like it hot and dry. So if you blast that plant with water, they're not, they're not, that makes them very unhappy. So uh, soapy water, um, I, you know, I, I would say neem oil, but I don't really know for sure. You know, there are organic ways to deal with that. And uh, here's here's a tip when you when you want to search something like that, if you put in um, in in Google, put in like spider mites and then put dot edu your pro or fact sheet, you're going to get information from universities across the country, like their horticultural programs. It's it's going to be great information based on real science. So, you know, that, that's a good way to search for things like that to get to a, you know a, a university hort program. Next question, how much super phosphate 0460 is safe to use? Do you recommend using it? Um, I have no idea. I, I've never used it. I, I wouldn't even know when or why to use it. And that goes back to my keep it simple method. You know, um, I, I, I just don't complicate things. You know, and a lot of people think I'm simple minded because of that, but I'm successful. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. All right, next question. I'm a Marine Corps veteran and new to this industry and business. Do you have a mentor in the San Diego area? I, um, San Diego. <clears throat> I know we got, I know of a guy in, in San Francisco and then, uh, Remember Lynn, she was at our shindig a couple of years ago. She's from California, but I don't remember. She's on the board a lot though. Um, but specifically, I, I, I don't, and, and I, I tell people, a lot of people come in there asking for a mentor and really your best mentor mentor in the world is, is the membership because now you're getting information from a lot of different people, a lot of different opinions and it's gents and you get differing opinions. So don't get too locked into, you know, if you found somebody in the industry that was extremely successful, yeah, that, that probably would work, but it, they also might make your head hurt too, but because they're not used to doing things on that small startup scale. So. All right. Next question. I'm rooting uh, Annabelle hydrangea, which I stuck in October. When is the best time to pot them and what soil to use? Well, the, the best, the, you know, the worst potting soil is probably a bag potting mix from, a, you know, a big box store or, or a garden center because the potting soils they sell are very different than the soils that we use in the industry. So um, the best thing to do is, is go to mikesbackyardnursery.com and, and use the search box and read the articles that I've done on, on potting soil. Um, the time to pot those hydrangeas is when they're well rooted. So if you stuck them in October, you know, they may not have done a lot of rooting over the winter. So they may not, you know, like my hardwood cuttings, I never get around, never feel safe to pot those until about July or so, which is not, it's kind of a terrible time to pot things, but that's kind of, just don't put them out in the blazing sun, pot them and then give them some shade. Next question, has inflation impacted plant prices in general? Are, are prices higher now than the previous year for, for plants? Absolutely, they have. Um, <clears throat> like every other industry, pretty much everything that we touch has gone up. Not, not to the point where it, we can't do what we do. It's just that we, we have to be mindful of that and in charge what our plants are worth. So, you know, if you got to pay a little bit more for things, and make sure you're charging a fair price for the stuff you're selling. Don't don't undercut yourself. You know, if you're if you're, I like growing stuff in a small container, and if I can get eight bucks for that thing, I'm a I'm a happy camper. You know, um, inflation has had a major impact on the industry overall, but I also think, and I, I could be wrong in this, but but probably not. I think that we're in for a correction in the economy because the economy has just gone smoking hot for a number of years now, which has driven this inflation. <clears throat> At some point that has to correct. The government will do 
raise interest rates and do things like that to try and slow it down. And hopefully they slow it down slowly and things start getting back to normal, but sometimes that causes a, a crash and then you know everything kind of comes to a screeching halt. Our experience in the, the backyard growing business is that doesn't phase us a bit because now when people, their money is tighter, they're, they're watching their money closer, all of a sudden they're not so apt to go waltzing into the big box or the garden center or the big box store and drop 50 bucks on a plant. But plants are therapy, gardening is therapy, and they love to come to us and buy things, you know, at the much lower price point, which where we can be very competitive. The other thing that's happening across the industry in the nursery industry, and I, I, I really need to, to touch on this, is there are a lot of second, third, and fourth generation nurseries that have been around a long time, and they are either just closing up because they're the, the real estate that they own is worth a lot of money, or they're selling out to a great somebody with great big deep pockets. Like we're around here, we have one company that has bought up seven extremely successful wholesale nurseries. They just recently acquired uh, a, a nursery right here in my hometown that is 1,800 acres. They've been around, uh, I don't remember, but they, they've been around for at least the 1940s, their third generation. And, and the guy that owned it was my age. He had no kids and, you know, he didn't want to work forever. So, you know, he took the chance and, and sold, sold out so that he can enjoy the rest of his life. So, but that makes it much, much easier for us little guys to just scoot in there and kind of fill that void because when, you know, um, when you when you have a big operation, it costs a lot of money to make a plan because you've got 10 people sitting at the office. You know, you got a, a, a salesman making $50,000 a year. You got a general manager making 125000 All of that has to come. That's a lot of plans for every person that works there. And those people aren't making plans. They're, they're just making people's lives miserable or whatever they do in there. I don't know. So we don't have any of that. So we don't have that overhead. So that gives us a huge advantage to just slip in there and, and supply that, that demand on that lower end, you know? So I don't think what we do will ever go out of style. And okay, next question. I just lost a Siberian apricot to some bug under the soil in the bark. Any suggestion for a tree to plant there that will be healthy and a source plant to sell? It's kind of like an inventory stock plant. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, uh, I guess that depends on where you're at and what bug, you know, infected your apricot. So I don't think I can really give you a, a good answer um, based on, 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 you know, that information. Sorry. Uh, next question. Is crepe myrtle relatively easy to propagate? I found it all but impossible. Best luck I've had is with uh, collected seed pods. I think it is. I think we have a number of people that have done crepe myrtle, and I think they do them as softwood cuttings under mist. You know, I, I'm not, I don't do them. They're not hardy here, but I know that it's something that we had a number of growers that were doing. Uh, Roger, shoot me an email for your uh, propagation, your propagation kit issue and we'll get you taken care of. Next question. I live in deep South Texas zone 9B. What would you suggest for uh, plug? <clears throat> what would you suggest for plug to four inch pots to wholesale Northern growers? Um, boy, that is... I don't, I don't know that I, that I, good. I mean, if you're in Texas, I'm not sure why you'd want to be growing things that you're going to ship to the north. Um, you know, the best thing to do is, is do things that are doing, that do well in your area. And again, hit all the local garden centers and see what they have. I know one of the things, I don't know why, but a lot of the rose growers who wholesale rose growers are in Texas. So that you know, and and they ship, they do ship more. They ship all over the place. So, um, other, other than that, I I don't, I'm not quite sure in your zone what's going to do well. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I just yeah. I, I don't yeah. think I'm the guy to answer that. 
we have hibiscus all over the place, every single garden center and, and even grocery stores, you can go up and buy a hibiscus bush. So there, somebody's buying a lot of them. Dustin's in Texas, so he knows more about it than I do. I'm, I'm in San Antonio. I don't know exactly what zone that is, but it's pretty far south. I do know that when I was in San Antonio and I was doing the river walk and all of that, I was completely dumbfounded by the beauty of the plants along the river walk. I mean, yeah. so the things there's that a, you can grow in Texas, you know, there's probably a lot of, wouldn't last a week in Ohio, but. There's a lot of crepe myrtle, like crepe myrtles are all over. I mean, the entrance of our entire subdivision here is all crepe myrtle, lined with crepe myrtle, even cherries. Cherry we tree. had a guy in Texas who was doing a lot of crepe myrtle. I mean, that, that was his business was crepe myrtle. Uh, next question. What are your feelings on worm castings or a tea made from worm castings? Well, I think worm castings are absolutely incredible. You know, they're, they're probably one of the highest uh, sources of, you know, organic material that you, that you can use. So in a, in a tea made from worm castings would be a great way to organically water and feed plants. So, yeah, if you've got access to them, I, I think it's a great, great thing. All right, so we got uh, three, two or three questions left. So probably last call on questions. Get your questions in before we wrap this thing up here. Uh, Ryan said, I'm fairly new to your newsletters, which I thank you very much for. How often do you do these Q&A ses uh, sessions? Well, we don't do them that often. Um, and this is probably the only second one that we've done. So. You know, COVID, COVID kind of kicked off the this type of thing for us, really. And actually, we 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 were doing a lot of meetings like this, but only for members. Um, uh, and those were extremely popular. We've done a bunch of them. They're recorded and they're available in the members area. But um, this type for you know for general public, I don't know. You know, we we may do another one later this year. We we really don't know. Yeah, uh, usually that once it gets too busy, it's it's kind of the second uh, we don't really have the time. Yeah, and but when we do them for the members, we do them as Zoom meetings. So we'll have I don't know what ten, at least ten or twelve, maybe more than that members who are interacting on screen on right. video. So it's a great way to get to know members that you probably will never have the the chance to meet in person because you're a couple thousand miles away. So. Yeah, th those are actual like live conference calls almost where we, everybody have, can talk. You can show your screen if you want to and all that. So that's that's more of a definitely more of an intimate setting. <clears throat> and one of the things that we've done there is we've done like tours of other people's nurseries and we, we, we encourage the members to do that tour offline shoot it have some, have somebody videotape you walk around your nursery and then we share that with other members and those have been extremely popular so um but you know there, there's a lot that we that we can't do you know to the general public we you know we have to kind of save it for our members they're the ones who paid a lot of money to be there all right next question where do you buy your containers um, I don't share wholesale sources publicly, um, and it, it really depends on where you're located because, you know, containers are, are well, I, I'll tell you what, let's, let, I, I know we have a lot of customers, a lot of members that buy from Greenhouse Mega Store, and I think another big wholesale nursery supply out but just bought them out if i'm not mistaken so that's i know a lot of people buy from greenhouse mega store and, and part of buy them on amazon they pay a little bit more but they get you know they can buy in smaller quantities so a part of the your like the backyard growing system it comes with the secret wholesale directory which has all kinds of different things including you know plants and and, and tools of the trade and all kinds of stuff that we've been using and, and our customers have been using and, you know, again, I'm, like I said, I'm not trying to pitch the members area, but for seven bucks, go in there and rob the bank. Sp spend 30 days in there, spend seven bucks and ask these questions in there because, you know, there's there's um, like there's some Amish suppliers who are located in different places around the country. I buy from a, I buy from an Amish company or Amish family. I also buy from a big, um, you know, corporate outfit here locally. 
but you know those those Amish outfits. I know there's several of them that I'm aware of around the country. And they they have no internet presence. You know, um, they, they just so you you got to kind of find that through somebody else. So. Uh, next question: Is there a market for for Scythia? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I'm I'm definitely not in love with Forsythia. It's not something that I like to grow. It's not something I like to have around. But there's probably growers out there that are selling 100,000 Forsythia a year. Um, there are one of the problems here in, in Ohio. In Ohio, our Forsythia tend to freeze, and they, they you never you know it's only every second or third year that you really get a good display of blooms. But there are some uh, Forsythia like. Uh, New, I think it's New Hampshire gold, which is supposed to be really good down to certain temperatures, you know. So, yeah, there, there's there's a market for, for Scythia, but there's a lot of things that I would grow before I did for Scythia because I think, you know, both wholesale and retail, you you know, you have more options. Uh, this is a question about membership. So um, they're wanting to know if they, if they take the 30-day trial option, but... Um, decide that they like it, can they go back and then do the 497 and option instead? Well, you you deal with that. So yeah, I mean I, I I allow that all the time because it, you know, it it's it's easy on my end. Just go ahead and seven bucks, get in there. And if it no matter if it's day one or day 31 or day 30, whatever it is, it's a 30 day trial. So day 30, if you just shoot me an email, uh, and what I'll end up doing is giving you a link because it it's possible that membership will be closed at that time. I'll give you a link where you can just get in kind of the back door and then um, I'll cancel your payments basically. So the, the thing that, that you need to understand though, is that if you email me on a Friday that at four o'clock, I'm not going to get that till Monday and your payments could kick in Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. So Why just understand. 24 hours a day? Yeah, I do. But you know, I have you, like you work for other I have a lot of email addresses I got to check. So, <laughs> um, you know, if you want to make Dustin's life easier, you know, first of all, if you do the seven dollar trial, we're not, you know, if you really gave us a hard time, we'd refund your seven dollars. But we really don't want to do that because it's just a, it would be a big pain in the butt. But if you want to do the seven dollar trial and then decide that you want the four ninety seven permanent membership, make his life easy and email him before you get billed the first time because this is all computer driven so when you order exactly i guess it's exactly 30 days later you're going to get your first payment so just let him know before that happens so it, it doesn't get all complicated and confusing but we'll work with you any way we can within reason yeah i mean if your first payment gets processed uh, you know accidentally or before i can get to the email then i'll i'll, I'll brief on that payment that way you're you know, we're even as far as the, the, the money goes. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm in, uh, next question. I'm in Nova Scotia, Canada on the East Coast, wondering what and how many different types of perennials and liners would you recommend starting out with? <clears throat> well, starting out, um, Starting out, maybe maybe five to ten perennials. Same thing with, with some liners. I think what you're going to find is that one once you get started, it, it gets kind of addictive, and you keep adding more and more things. So, but you know, don't hold yourself to any specific number. What, mo most importantly, what we used to have, what used to happen, people would come in, they would buy in, they start growing plants, and they start acquiring plants, and they start building inventory, building inventory, building inventory. And then they would finally decide to have a plant sale. And that's all fine and well, but I don't like that model. I like to see people come in and acquire a few perennials and get some, and then put them up for sale because nothing will give you more confidence that people are actually, because we all have doubts. I mean, I've had them, everybody has, you because you're out there, you're doing all this stuff, you see these plants, you're like, eh, is anybody really going to buy plants for me? So put them up for sale and then sell a few because nothing will give you more confidence to do the next batch, the next batch than to sell some of what you have. So my new strategy is to sell as quickly as you can, you know, so I hope that was a good answer. Yep. Um, just for anyone who needs the support email, it's Mike 
Dustin at gmail.com. That's the easiest one. No M -I -K -E hyphen, just Mike Dustin. M-I-K-E-D-U-S-T-O-N at gmail.com. And there's also a contact us link on, on the websites, right? Yeah, all of the websites, either top or the very bottom, it's going to be a, a contact link or, or at least an email address for support. Uh, next question. I bought a corn plant from Costco and the leaves are turning yellow and brown. What can I do to save it? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what that type of plant is. I don't either. So I'm not quite sure when you say corn plant, but uh, she, if it's... She had the like a something else in there and I already got rid of the, the question. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, it's, if the leaves are turning yellow and brown, it's not happy. So, you know, I mean, there's a possibility that it froze before you got it, that it dried out or... So it's either typically plants are too dry or too wet. It's not like most of the time people want to buy, grab a bottle of something and pour it on there. And that's usually not the solution. It, you know, think about too dry or too wet. That's probably what the plant. Yeah, that, that's what it is with succulents. If it's turning brown or yellow, it, it, you either put too much water on it or it needs more. And it's that it, somebody said it's a house plant. Somebody just um, set, uh, you put a question in there. Yeah, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not big on house plants. I just don't have experience with that. Uh, next question. I've followed your method for some time now. I'm finally getting a chance to begin selecting plants currently in Dallas zone five to seven and want to know if you would suggest adding a high or low balanced NPK to dogwood cuttings or not. Um, and I would, again, I would go right back to the slow release that we use. So I, like I said, I use, I'm using Osmocote um, 1812 5, I think it is. It's a five month release for years and years and years. I use the Osmocote triple 14. Um, then there's, you know, uh, uh, what was the other one that I would, for, I can't even think of it. Floor, floor, can, floor. Floor can, I think, you know, there, there's three, but you definitely want something that is a, at least a three to four month release, because if not, it's going to kill your plants overnight. It's just going to release way too quickly. Or something organic. All uh, right, next question. Simeon in New Orleans just want to know how many members do you have in Louisiana, especially North Shore area? So, I get this question at probably at least once a week, if not more than that. We don't know. <laughs> that's the, that's we, don't exactly, know. We, we don't know because we let people take a trial. They come in, we treat them as, as permanent members. So that skews our numbers. We don't know, you know who's an active member, who's not an active member. You know, we, we just don't have that compiled anywhere. Louisiana, yeah, we, like you, we, we had a guy in Louisiana like, that was doing really, really well, but I think he just moved to South Carolina. So I'm trying right. to think who else is in Louisiana. I don't know. Like we, we log in and you can see it. there's over 10,000 members that have been on the site at one time or another. But now you go in and look and it shows how many are active. But like every day it's different people and they come and go. So. But, it, but the truth is, if you're the only member from Louisiana, that's not a bad thing, it, it, you know, because we're still going to be able to help you. The other members are still going to be able to help you. So don't let that in. And, and I know that's kind of a human nature thing. People always come in mm -hmm. and immediately they want to find how many people are in their area. And that's fine if there, if there are people in your area. But if there aren't, then trust me, when I started growing on my own years ago, even though I spent my whole life from 16 years on in this industry when I finally started growing on my own it was very very frustrating because people didn't want to tell me anything they didn't want to answer my questions because I had been a customer now I was asking them questions and they're you know, they got real dumb they didn't seem to know anything and that's one of the reasons that I started doing what I do I just think people have a right to know so the, the this is one of the reasons I, I took probably half a day to create this map. And this is literally not even a, a fifth of all of the peop, the growers that we have uh, provided training to just in the United States alone. Um, some of them are active, many of them are not, and they come and go. So uh, that's just kind of a, a glimpse. And uh, you can see it. There's just people all over the place. 
And, and that, you know, that's the thing. Life happens. So we have people that are, you know, we hear from them almost on a daily basis. And then all of a sudden we don't hear from them. And then six months, 18 months later, like, hey, I'm back. You know, life happened, blah, blah, blah. You know, but I'm, I'm you know, good to go. So, and that's the beauty of, of having that permanent membership. We're here when you're ready. All right. Next question. How often do the Zoom meetings happen in the members area? And do you have members other than America inside uh, the members area to talk to? Talk to? <clears throat> we have we have some members in Canada, um, not a ton that are active all at the same time. Other parts of the world, not so much in the members area. I mean, we had a guy who was in Hong Kong and I'm, I think he was an American in Hong Kong. Um, I, I still see him from time to time, but, um, but I, you know, I'm not going to tell you that we have a bunch of international members in there because we don't. Mainly because the, 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 you know, one of the big benefits of the members area is buying and selling to and from one another. And, and it, it, it's just not something you can take advantage of if you are um, in, in a different country. So uh, regarding this map, this is not a, an interactive map. This is just an image. So somebody asked, how do you access the map? We, first of all, we don't, we're not going to give away, you know, private data from our customers. And especially if people aren't really, they don't have a nursery or anything going. These are just people that have purchased some kind of training from us uh, over the course of our time online and teaching this stuff. Uh, so we got... Two questions here. Would daylilies be a good perennial to specialize in? Um, yes. I mean, there's a lot of people that specialize in daylilies. There's a lot of different varieties of them. Um, you know, I, I got a we got a gal here in Ohio. She, she's been really, really successful um, with just about everything that she's done with us. But daylilies are a big thing for her, and she kind of does it, you know. Uh, when they're in bloom, people come out and they dig them on demand. I personally don't, you know, I do, um, I only do about, what am I doing? Little Business, Eeny Weeny, and Trilata are three that I do on a regular basis, you know, because they're, those are all three kind of like dwarf daylilies, but daylilies, you know, if you're, if you want to grow for the wholesale market, I have a friend of mine is a, a nursery stock broker. He's been in the business forever. And he said, as far as daylilies are concerned, you know, for the landscape trade, you, you really only need three varieties, Stella Dioro, Pardon Me, and Happy Returns. Those are the three that landscapers are asking for, because those are the three that landscape architects are drawing into these big commercial plantings where they might put three or 400 daylilies in front of a shopping mall. So, but that doesn't mean that a, 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 a landscaper in your area that's a customer of yours is not gonna buy like little business. I'm sure they will when they're, they're just not familiar with it. But once I educate them on the fact that it's a really dwarf compact daylily and it's got a red bloom, everybody wants it. And the same thing with Eeny Weeny. Eeny Weeny's a small, it's a bright yellow, but it's kind of small and compact. So when people know that they they want it and they buy it, so it, a lot of it has to do with educating your customers and of course posting a photo on social media will immediately sell them. All right, last question, which we you touched on briefly, but uh, well, more than briefly, but um, does this four ninety seven price model still apply? And if not, what do you suggest, especially when dealing with all different size pots slash plants? Well, I, I I don't really promote the 497 price model because you know costs have gone up. I have gone. I'm selling pretty much the same size plant, but I am at seven dollars and ninety seven cents. Some of our members are at six dollars and ninety seven cents, but that doesn't mean you know we do that because that's a unique selling proposition. And I you know I've got marketing books and you know and I explain all that in great detail, but. Um, that's a great draw when people can come and fill their car with all kinds of plants at the same price point. But it doesn't mean that you have to charge that. You can put things in two gallons and charge anywhere from $10 to $20 for them. You can put things in three gallons and charge $12 to $24 for them. So there's no set, you know, just because you're selling a bunch of stuff at, at say, $6.97, it doesn't mean you have to sell everything at that price. I mean, I've got Japanese maples I'll have this spring that are going to range in price from 
$49 to probably $199. So it, it just depends. It's, it's all about the plant and the value. And, you know, when people see something they like, they're going to pay the price. When you walk through garden centers, you're going to figure that out in a hurry. People are willing to pony up money for plants. So my thing is I like to sell a whole bunch of plants at one time to a bunch of customers at one time. Um, I don't like to have a plant sitting there and put $60 on it and we'll look at it all summer hoping somebody comes along and buys it. I like to see things turn quickly. So that's, you know, but it, it, it's your business. It's your business model. So you can do it however you want. So that's, that's all the questions we got. We, we dodged a question though. Um, they asked about the Zoom meetings in the members area and how often we do them. Oh yeah. Uh, the answer to that is we don't do them on a regular basis. We are not opposed to doing them on a semi-regular basis. And if you're in a members area, say, hey, Mike, why don't we do a Zoom meeting about this? And then we'll, we'll just do it because all the members like it. You know, um, spring's not the ideal time because oh, everybody's busy. Everybody is busy. But, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever, we, whatever you want us to do. I mean, you know, that's, we're all about making this work for everybody that's involved. Did you want to show inside the the buy sell area or not? If you, if you want, we can take a look in there. You, you want to bring it up and I got yeah, I got it up. I haven't refreshed it in a while, but I don't know if that matters. And so so this is our this is our buy sell area. So the top ad in here, I see uh, ruby slippers, hi, ruby slippers and Annabelle hydrangeas, blue mouse ears hosta. Open that up, Dustin. Blue mouse ears is. is that, that's a really, really hot seller. And I bought, this is one of our members in Kentucky. I bought stuff from Dave. I bought a lot of Ruby slippers from him. Scroll down, let's see what he's, the Ruby slippers are um, $3.09 a piece. He's got 70 of them available. The Annabelle's are $2.79 a piece. These are probably liner sizes. Shipped yeah. in two and a half inch pots. <clears throat> okay, the Blue Mouse Ears, 309 for Blue Mouse Ears Hosta. That, and then there's a Korean Azalea for 279 So oh, wait, go down a little bit lower, though, because the first thing is, hey, Dave, can I get 50 Annabelle? Let's look at his orders. Um, this this guy oh, wants this, 20 Ruby Slippers, 20 Annabelle. This was, this was four, he posted this ad four hours ago. Okay. Uh, 20, oh, add 20 Azaleas to my order. Five Annabelle's, two mouse ears, ten ruby slippers. Um, so then that's the beauty of this is that you can buy in small quantities like that. You can't do that with other wholesalers. So somebody wants 10 ruby slippers. And like like Dustin said, this ad will be up for seven days, but I kind of think that within a couple of days, Dave is probably gonna say, so loud, please delete. Yeah, you know, you that's just typically posted it four hours ago. So he's already yeah. got all those orders in just four hours. Yeah, so here's Hosta, Red Another Maple, Hens and Chicks. Posted six hours ago, and it's got right. seven, seven people reply already. All right, here's one, right, the, the, from Tracy, more, more fabulous plants. I, you know, I met Tracy last summer. She came to our shindig, her and her husband. Um, I hear fantastic things about her plants. People really like, let's see what's inside of her ad. So a lot of a lot of details on how to order one door for the uh, ivory silk lilac syringa yeah lilac um, two two seventy five each you know two seventy each if you buy twenty five of them um, sky pencil holly great seller two dollars each tax extensive form of this uh, three twenty five each. Willowwood by Burnham, three and a quarter each, or some sassafras. So, but it, again, you know, and the other thing is, if you're in in the members area, we have a discussion area. If you're looking for something and you don't see it in the buy sale, just say, "Hey, does anybody have twenty of these?" You're going to get a reply. People do that all the time. So, so anyway, that's what the buy sale area looks like. And I don't know when you know when she posted that, but. That was six, six or uh, oh, hold on, I'll look and see. 
That was almost it's seven days ago, that one. Okay, so that one's ready to come down. So she's probably gotten a ton of orders off of that. Yeah. All right, so basically we did this to kind of give you an idea of what it takes to get started, what you need to get started. I hope we answered as, as many of your questions as we possibly could. Um, we're, you know, if, you, if you're interested, grab the backyard growing system. If you're really interested, do the seven day, $7 trial for the members area. We've already explained, we'll work with you on that. If you're, you're you know, if you don't want to get billed, Take advantage of it for seven days, get all you can for seven dollars. I mean, for 30 days, get all you can, you know, for seven bucks and then email Dustin before your billing is due and he'll, you know, he'll stop your payment so you don't get charged. I mean, we want you to experience it. That's really what we're trying to do. If you if you need any kind of links for anything, the backyard growing system or the members area, it's all in the, on the products page. Just go to mikesbackernursery.com and click products. Every product that we sell, I think, is, is linked on this page somewhere. That donkey's not for sale, at least not today. He <laughs> might be on, tomorrow. He's getting a pedicure in the morning. That's what you need to do. We need to rename this offer to everything on the page except the donkey. Right. Yeah, we should. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up. I see two questions. Are there questions? I already closed that box. Oh, okay. Oh, they're just thanking us. So two all right. Hey, thank you for hanging out with us. And you know, we hope to see you in the members area. Um, and of course, you know, I'm in Ohio. If you're in the area, you can always, you know, stop and visit. If you want to make sure I'm gonna be here, you know, you can uh, email Dustin and he'll, you know show you how to get in touch with me if you're going to be in the area so thank you very much and uh, good luck enjoy your summer you know it's finally going to warm up here in the north so we got to get to work yep all right thank you guys have a good night all right good night dustin good night